Welcome to Tramlines, a podcast from Agri. I'm your host, Tony Smith, putting your questions to the experts. In this episode, I'm talking to Ben Lowe, National Forage Product Manager for Agri. Today, we will be finding out what the future holds for maize with a focus on key areas that we need to or even must consider before we put that crop in the ground. So, good morning, Ben. Good morning, Tony. And it's great to have you back on uh, on Tramlines. It really, really is. So um, let, let's start off with where we are with uh, maize. And here we're, we're talking about the forage crop, aren't we? So where are we right now with that crop? What, how does it look in terms of the future? Well, I think we've got um, quite a few changes potentially on the horizon for, for maize within the UK, Tony. Um, even looking back at the likes of Brexit, for example, we've got some implications uh, for material even entering the UK now. Um, so availability of, of material is is changing. And of course, um, in, in the short term, uh, obviously, we've gone through a lot of changes in the way that we're able to secure and also import seed into the UK. Um, so which reflects on demand uh, from the UK versus supply from, from the continent. So you know, there's going to be a change in landscape, which could potentially see uh, the requirement for more volume of, of fewer varieties for the UK. Right. So there's quite a few things going on there. And and just remind us that of the environmental considerations that we just need to bear in mind and think about. Well, maize can always be and, and has been um, a, a very emotive topic to many uh, in terms of a, a species within rotations. In many ways, we all know that there is associated risks with growing maize, whether it be um, in, in some cases delayed harvest, damage to soil and soil structure and profile, um, overwintered stubbles being left bare, uh, leading to, in some instances, uh, runoff issues with water courses locally and, and, and of course nutrient loss over, over that winter period as well. Um, so we need to ensure that we are taking maize forward on a, on a much more sustainable and, and environmentally friendly footing, um, which not only of course benefits the, the environment, but of course ultimately benefits the crop as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just remind us, I mean, what sort of acreage is grown in the UK at the moment? So the overall UK market is around about 580,000 packs of maize seed, which is equivalent to just short of around about 700,000 acres. Um, I mean, to put that into context, Tony, when it is that we're discussing um, the limitations, the ability to develop or or flex within the UK market, um, there is varieties on the continent that sell that same volume as the entire UK market in one single variety. So as, as, a, as an industry, as a country, um, and, and as, a, as a species that we, we hold dearly uh, within rotations, quite rightly for the benefits it can bring, we need to bear that in mind. Um, and like I say, at the moment, it's, it's not looking you know, as easy as it always has been to, to uh, gain access to stock varieties. Um, so more important than ever, we need to be looking at, at what we can do to um, secure the future for, for maize, for, for, the, for the country and also for, for individual farms. Yeah, no, sure. Okay. But uh, 700,000 acres is, is quite an acreage. So, uh, and I know a really important uh, forage crop for, for uh, many, many uh, livestock growers. Talking about its value to the individual grow or livestock enterprise, um, in an earlier podcast uh, that we, we recorded with you, you, you talked about taking stock of understanding your forage. So how important is maize in terms of its contribution to a livestock enterprise? How important is it as a forage? It, it can be, it, it is vital in many situations. Um, of course, it extends further than than just traditional livestock uh, enterprise in the UK. Of course, we've got a significant uh, anaerobic digestion uh, enterprise uh, uh, um, sector within the UK now, um, which does rely heavily on maize and the attributes that it can bring, not only, of course, from a nutritional point of view, um, whether it be starch, uh, ME, and of course, dry matter yield, um, but also what it brings to, to rotations as well. You know, it is a key crop to have within many rotations to extend rotations, um, but it has to be managed accordingly. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, harvest dates, quality, yield, all balanced off against each other to ensure that we're, we're growing these crops responsibly. So let's move to growing the crop. Could you remind us, you know, what critical aspects do we have to get right 
when we're thinking about where we're going to grow it and how we're going to grow it? So, site is definitely uh, the, the first one. Um, quite often you, you come across situations with, with maize where maize has been grown routinely on the same ground for, for quite some time now. Um, the reasons for that are understandable. Um, in some businesses, that, that ability to, to move uh, or in fact take fields out of production um, is limited because of, of how uh, thin the margin of error can be in terms of crop production that a lot of these farms are, have been, to be fair, driven towards over the last uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, but it is, it, it's maintaining that, that, that correct site, that right position, uh, the situation within the rotation, and also what it is that you as a grower are wanting to achieve, whether it's a, an extra early harvest to ensure a crop is, is drilled behind that, or if it is that you are you know, on, on, in a more favorable region, you can get away with growing it on some more heavier ground because you know, the locality of where you are um, will, will aid you in that harvest date. But you know, maize will always give you back what you give it. And if you give it everything that you can in terms of the right situation, the right drilling date, warmth, moisture at, at drilling, um, it will return that that tenfold and you know sometimes we've seen anecdotally um, massive benefits in in overall maize yield where a grower's hand has had to been forced from the harvest conditions from the previous year if there's significant damage from a field that is un undrillable by the spring still and they've ended up taking a field out of production and going and putting that into maize you know it's not uncommon for, for me to get a phone call to say by the time we harvested that field of, of fresh maize on, on fresh ground, it was yielding 30 to 40% more than, than any of the others. Um, you know, so it is stark what maize can return you if, if, all, those, if all those bits of the puzzle are, are put together correctly. So Ben, you've mentioned varietal choice uh, a few times now, actually. So I, I'm sensing that it is very, very important to get right. Uh, well, what is the current thinking on varietal choice? Um, so from past experience, majority of growers obviously want to try and combine overall quality with overall yield. Um, unquestionably, in the past, the earlier you go with the variety in terms of maturity date, we've always had to take some sort of a compromise on the chin of, of overall yield. Uh, the very, very early varieties don't tend to be the, the highest yielding varieties. Counteracting that, the higher yielding varieties have always tended to be quite often the, the later varieties. Um, of course, this goes hand in hand with, with you know, rolling the dice in many ways in terms of that harvest date, ensuring those crops have come off and, and harvested in, in good order. Um, but what we've seen develop over the last four to five years in particular is actually the advances um, in yield and quality from the earlier sector varieties. Without a doubt, there's still going to be the requirement for later maturing varieties. If you're a grower that's growing, you know, a few thousand acres of maize, maybe you need to stagger your harvest date out. But that requirement for, for yield being driven by, um, you know, a later maturing variety just isn't there anymore. Um, and like I say, the, not only are we seeing it from a, from a market point of view, that's what our growers, our farmers are wanting to discuss with us, getting more from getting earlier. Um, that's actually where, you know, subconsciously you look through the varieties, that's where the breeders are going and, and they've got the answers and we have the solutions of material available to us. So Ben, that sounds like great news with regards to choice of earlier varieties that are potentially going to perform well um, on farm. But can you just tell us a little bit more about what those key advantages are? And I'm thinking about the important decisions around environmental management and land use. So by having a variety that you can harvest earlier, um, it ensures that you are A, harvesting in, in, in more favourable conditions. Um, none of us can, can counteract the, the, the power of Mother Nature nowadays. She, um, she seems to throw all sorts of curveballs at us. Um, but you minimise your risk of, of harvesting in, in marginal uh, type conditions of weather. Um, it, it ensures that there's the chance of getting a crop in behind the maize, of course, um, it, it, again, in good condition, um, whether that be, uh, you know, if maize is in a rotation, it could be a winter wheat following that, or it could be a catch crop between maize crops, maybe. Um, it could be uh, a likes of, a, of an Italian, it could be a forage rye um, that you're putting in there to establish in between maize crops. Um, give you ground cover over the winter. Um, of course, hold on to valuable nutrients within that soil that without a living crop in it over the winter would have dissipated and leached away. Um, maintain soil structure, reduces soil erosion and runoff potential, but then gives you 
a, a, a you know a production of forage um, to be harvested in the spring before going back into maize again. And following on from that, Ben, what are your thoughts? What's your current thinking around the subject of under sowing maize? From my point of view, and this is on a national level and and wider than just agri, there is there is still a lot of um, questions to be answered around the, the best practice for under sowing. Um, it isn't just a case of, you know, chuck some grass seed under your maize and, and you'll be fine. It all needs to, again, as maize is, it's quite a big jigsaw puzzle and, and, and all those pieces need to be put together. It's all in relation to everything else that you've got going on on the farm and the type of ground that you're, you're growing your maize on. So, for example, um, if you're looking at establishing uh, grass seed or a, or a companion crop um, under your maize at the point of at the point of drilling your maize are you going to be impacted by potential requirements for post herbicide um, uh, sorry post emergent herbicide requirements so could you establish something that your post uh, emergence herbicide regime will then actually end up killing when you go in there um, off the back of that then you look at you know establishing something at the six to eight leaf stage um, and within the maze um, and again, this can quite often be for, for more marginal uh, region growers where they're just not definitely sure they can establish a crop following maize harvest. Um, so if it is, it, right, we can, we can get something established at that six to eight leaf stage. We've got machinery available to us locally. Again, that can be a very limiting factor that, that actually stalls a lot of progression of growers looking to under sow their maize, actually availability of, of machinery to do the job locally to them. But as we've seen this, uh, this last year, for example, the perfect time for doing that was the end of May, beginning of June. We had significant rainfall all the way through May. Um, early June, the sun came out and shone you know, beautifully for us, but ground conditions just didn't speed up and, and, and get uh, drillable fast enough. Um, but the maize took off, you know, it had that moisture, it had that warmth and it went away. And in many situations on my farms with my growers, the maize grew so fast, we couldn't get, actually get in to do the under sowing at a six to eight leaf stage um, because the, the maize had got too tall by the time uh, the ground conditions could allow us to get on. Um, so it, it, it is, it's, it's a balancing act and it's not a one size fits all. And, and it's just not as simple as, as um, you know, you could possibly uh, first imagine. No, thanks for that, Ben. Uh, it, it really is a very interesting topic of discussion, and I'm sure listeners will, will take away this thought and uh, uh, discuss it further between themselves. But uh, I understand to sort of to enable people to try this out, and for those that are interested at, and are already uh, using this technique, you have a specific uh, varietal mix that you've put together for under sowing. Uh, tell us a bit more about that, Ben. Yes, yeah. So we, we've identified the, the need and the requirement and, and to help sort of answer some of those initial questions and make it a lot easier for, for growers to get on board with this. Um, we have um, produced a specific master lay in the form of our maize master, which is a dedicated and designed um, under sowing grass mixture. Um, it's there to, to give overall um, cover, of course, for, for the winter. Um, it contains festuloleums with very strong, deep rooting systems to them, um, but without being over uh, uh, vigorous and aggressive above ground. So they're there to maintain structure. Um, so it gives obviously the benefits of, of, of better traveling at, at the point of harvest. It gives you, you know, the option of possibly some winter grazing by some, uh, you know, tack on sheep over, over the winter. Um, but then of course, a, a, you know, a cutter of graze before you go back into maize again the following year. But, but again, it's all to do with the timings of that. Um, you know, to take it to the other extreme, you know, we have had incidences where, you know, right, we'll just try to chuck a bit of grass seed in and, and you get the timing wrong and you wouldn't even know that maize had been drilled. You just think it was grass, you know, and, and if that timing isn't just quite right, um, it, it can go very, very wrong. But the benefits, without a doubt, mess massively outweigh the, the, you know, the negatives there. But it's just something that as, a, as an industry, we need to we need to all accept that there's still a lot of unanswered questions um, out there, not only just around grass, but also other crops that we could be drilling or other species within the maize. Um, I mean, and in many ways, I'm doing quite a bit of trial work now to, to answer some of the questions that I know won't work, just to, so that we can say, we've tried it, it didn't work, it failed, it affected the maize, it didn't, it didn't establish, um, just to try and answer some more of those questions that are, that are there. 
So let's take a step forward in time, Ben, and assume that we've got some fantastic maize forage in the clamp. What is the next step for the farmer in terms of assessing the quality of that forage and how it fits within the ration for their livestock unit? You know, what is the next step? So, so the next step would be obviously, you know, uh, gain a, a forage sample and analysis of, of your maize, um, but also regularly test that maize as well. Um, you can't just take one sample and say, right, that's what the clamp is for forever. Um, even if you have good levels of consistency through the quality of your maize, the maize itself and, and the silage it's producing when it's in the clamp, of course, alters differently the, the longer that it's in there. Um, Balancing rations is always relative to what else you have uh, harvested that year. Um, last year, we saw a lot of, uh, again, due to Mother Nature and the weather, we saw a lot of um, very large, bulky and very, very high dry matter first cuts uh, in grass. Um, so again, it, it's it, it's something that we, we, we need to get back to. And as I mentioned on, on that um, uh, podcast, Tony, the fact that we need to take every farm and every farm needs to look at itself as an individual. And for the grower that's perhaps tempted to grow more maize or grow the crop for the first time, how does it stack up um, in its performance, you know, financially in terms of its contribution to the farm business? Um, return on investment, of course, and efficiency of, of these forages that they're producing is, is right up there, um, you know, with, with what they're wanting to, to try and achieve and, um, you know, ultimately in, improve across. What I would say is that time and time again, maize comes back to being um, one of the most um, efficient crops in terms of nutrition input. And Ben, that can only be good news for farmers listening in terms of thinking about establishing this crop this coming season. Is there anything else that we should be considering, uh, bearing in mind, just thinking about when it comes to the costs of establishing the crop, seed for example, and the return on our investment, you know, contribution to the farm's profitability and sustainability? Anything you'd like to add? Another thing to bear in mind, Tony, is the fact that if we look back at varieties, um, you know, over the last five years, I'm not wanting to do the job here of, of, you know, our breeders in many ways. But in some instances, yes, we have seen prices of of maize seed possibly lifting by around about £30 a hectare. But when you take into consideration the development in ME yield, dry matter yield and starch yield, those varieties on average, especially within the early sector, they're returning around about an extra £1,500 a hectare in quality. Um, so that really does negate, you know, of course, that increase of, of the initial seed price, but it's value for money when it looks at a return on investment. Ben, we could talk about maize for hours. It's, uh, it's one of my favourite crops, actually. But, you know, for today, what top tip would you leave us with uh, for us to take away and think about after this podcast? My top tip would be to evaluate what you're doing with maize, um, try and see what we can do to uh, improve the production of, of maize on your farm um, to hopefully um, mitigate against any potential changes that we, we may or may not have control of uh, in the future regarding the, the production of maize. Um, really bore down into to what varieties are returning uh, what for you um, and look at potentially you know opening the door to newer material that can give you that earlier harvest, but without compromising on yield or quality. Um, You know, this is the time where we really need to start um, scrutinising maize and and getting as much from it as we possibly can. Well, thank you, Ben, for sharing your thoughts today concerning the key areas that we really must focus on when it comes to growing maize this season. And there are clearly opportunities to manage this crop in a way that strikes a balance between farm profitability and environmental considerations. And as we mentioned before, you may also find an earlier podcast, Taking Stock of Understanding Your Forage, of interest too. That's it for this podcast, but do tune in again as we meet the experts throughout the season, exploring the many immediate and longer-term questions for growers and farmers in the UK. If you have any questions that you'd like us to ask the experts, email info at agri.co.uk. See you next time.